For many years, for those who followed Atlantic Grand Prix Wrestling, there was one name that stood out as probably the most popular and the most respected member of the uh, AGPW. Of course, we're going to talk about the great Leon Cormier, better known as his ring name, Leo Burke. Now, uh, Leon Cormier was born June 29, 1948, in the great town of Dorchester, New Brunswick. During his career, which started in 1966 and uh, kind of unofficially ended in 1992 with his retirement, he competed across Canada and the United States and also wrestled internationally for both Puerto Rico's WWC and the National Wrestling Alliance affiliates in New Zealand. Now, uh, because he was born in New Brunswick and he was a great uh, uh, you know, draw in the Maritimes. He spent the majority of his career, and uh, but in the States, he wrestled as Tommy Martin. But in Canada, primarily, he wrestled as Leo Burke uh, for, uh, as a hero, Atlantic Grand Prix, and mostly as a heel in the great uh, Calgary Stampede Wrestling, owned by uh, the great Stu Hart and members of the Hart family. Now, this is amazing for for a guy that never really hit you know, WWE or NWA major leagues in, in the States and worldwide. He held, get this, 46 different wrestling championships because he was just as good as a singles competitor and uh, as a tag team, uh, you know, battler. Uh, he wasn't a high flyer. He can be saying he was a workman-like wrestler or grappler, but he was so effective in the ring, he was a ring technician. The only comparable one I can kind of relate to is Bret Hart because Bret Hart could bring all kind of uh, effort into ring like Leo Burke could. And Bret Hart said in his uh, WWE uh, return autobiography uh, or videography a few years ago that Leo Burke was one of his favorite and one of the best Canadian wrestlers of a generation. I tend to agree. Leo Burke is easily a top 50 Canadian wrestler of all time. Again, he would have been higher, but, uh, you know, he never uh, hit the next level because Leo Burke uh, had a dedication to his fans. And I think he really enjoyed... Uh, doing, uh, not say the small shows, but the medium-sized shows across Canada, especially in these uh, many runs in Stampede and Atlantic Grand Prix. Now, uh, he was noted for having, you know, quite a few uh, dramatic feuds, uh, including uh, Cuban Assassin and uh, Bret Hart. Actually, both of him, he would, he would he later reconciled, and he joined forces with both of them to meet the whole tag team championships. Now, uh, upon his retirement in 1992, he served as a trainer for WWE and World Championship Wrestling, and uh, he had c competed, or uh, what I call appeared, in numerous uh, cards over the years since his official retirement. And of course, we also have the Leo Burke Cup, which is a, it's a strongly recognized tournament throughout the years. Now, uh, his family, because his brothers as well are legendary wrestlers, and uh, uh, including uh, my, uh, my favorite name of any wrestler of all time, The Beast, and uh, they've all been honored, uh, the Cormier family has been honored by the Cauliflower, Cauliflower Alley Club, which of course is a fraternal uh, organization of professional wrestlers, and he's a uh, much decorated member of the Stampede uh, Wrestling Hall of Fame. Now, like I said, his career started in 1966, but uh, his career started way before because his brothers, Yvonne Cormier and Rudy Kay, um, uh, trained him, but uh, Leo decided at an early age I think at age six that he wanted to become a professional uh, wrestler. Now, uh, Cormier made his debut in 1966 in Central States Wrestling, which at the time was an affiliate of NWA, and he used uh, the ring name uh, Tommy Martin. Back then he was a clean cut, uh, you know, a very nice looking young gentleman, kind of like a, a pop hero of the wrestling ring. And he won his first uh, championship actually less than two years later on October 11, 1968 by uh, defeating Bob Brown for the NWA Central States Heavyweight Championship. Later that month, he, uh, he f formed a tag team with his brother, uh, Romeo, uh, who was competing under the ring name Terry Martin, doing the Central States version of the NWA North American Tag Team Championship from Brown and Bob Geigel. Now, that reign lasted uh, uh, for seven days when they, they lost the uh, belts to the infamous Texas Outlaws, which is, of course, Dirty Dick Murdoch and Dusty Rhodes. And the following moment, uh, he also lost the heavyweight championship to Rhodes. So starting off early his career, he was learning the ropes literally and taking on uh, people like Dusty Rhodes and 
Dusty Rhodes has said in public reports throughout the years, he was always impressed with uh, Burke's uh, professionalism inside and outside the ring. Now, in the early 70s, this is where uh, the first of his maritime runs began. He spent uh, the, much of the early 70s competing in his brother Jean-Louis' Eastern Sports Association, ESA, which owned International Wrestling, or uh, IW, as both a singles and tag team wrestler. Now, uh, he didn't want to use uh, his name recognition to further his own career, so he took, instead of taking the Cormier name in wrestling, he uh, took the last name of his friend, boxer Jackie Burke. Now, the four Cormier brothers uh, also could be, all competed in the territory, and he often joined forces and feuds with their promotions, top heel the wrestlers, similar to the Von Erichs in Texas. Now, Burke won the IW North American Heavyweight uh, title uh, on June 22, 1971, by defeating Eric Pomeroy, because that title uh, reign lasted uh, three months, uh, had some really great matches, but eventually lost the title to uh, Gino Brito during a match in Halifax, but uh, regained the uh, championship five days later. Now, uh, on August 8, 1972, Burke uh, teamed with his brother Romeo, who was now wrestling as Bobby Kay, to win the ESA International Tag Team Championships. Now, he held the title until the following June, uh, when he dropped it to Fred Sweeten and Kirk Von Steiger. And uh, in August 73, Burke became the, the first ESA taped fist championship uh, holder when a promotion uh, op- uh, awarded him the title. Now, uh, from there, Burke next competed in NWA's Amarillo, Texas territory. He teamed with his uh, brother, The Beast, uh, in, and in January 74, he defeated Don Fargo and Hank James to win the NWA Western States Tag Team Championships. Uh, but he held that for two months until he lost to Ricky Romero and former world champion Dory Funk Jr. Now, returning to the ASA, uh, he had a short reign as IW North American champion in May 74, and he followed it in July with another reign for the ESA International Tag Team Championship, uh, again with his brother, The Beast. Now, uh, they held the title for a month, but less than a month later, they dropped it to a Ghetto Mongol and the Great Kuma. Now, that month, he also dropped the tape fist championship to Mongol, but regained it in a rematch within days. The following year, he, he held the North American Championship twice, defeating Mongol and Bob Brown for the respective titles. Now, uh, for the second victory, uh, Burke substituted for the infamous killer Carl Krupp, who was unable to compete. And although Burke won the match, the uh, title was later returned to Brown after Brown appealed the decision, claiming that a substitute wrestler should not be eligible to win a championship. Um, uh, Burke had one more reign with the tape fist style before vacating the title. But you're seeing there was a continuation of having Burke either at the top of the card or holding the major belts because he was drawing so much uh, fan support or fan ire in some cases. Now, uh, when he went on to uh, compete again for Central States, he teamed with a beast in the tournament to win the vacant NWA Western States Tag Team Championship. Uh, the brothers devil- defeated Silver Streak and Ricky Romero in the finals on February 20th, 20, 1976 to win the belts, but then lost to a rematch one week later. Now, returning from Texas to, uh, to the Maritimes in Nova Scotia, Burke uh, became the only person ever to hold the ESA Maritimes Heavyweight Championship. Uh, he defeated the Brute to win the title, but when the ESA closed in 77, the title became uh, part of uh, Bobby Kay's uh, Trans-Canada Wrestling because uh, TCW also didn't, uh, uh, you know, uh, stay too long. Uh, Burke's uh, Maritimes uh, Heavyweight Championship was retired. Now in the 76, Burke, uh, Burke also defeated the Brute to begin another reign as IW North American Heavyweight Champion, but uh, dropped it later on uh, to Michel uh, Dubois, but he defeated uh, Frenchie Mart to take back the title on July 4, 1977. Now, the title was also retired when TCW closed that month, and, but, but prior to the promotion closing, uh, Burke also has a short reign with Hubert Gallant with the ESA Maritime Tag Team Championship. Now, while competing in Nova Scotia, uh, Burke also challenged Terry Funk for the NWA Championship. Uh, Burke uh, almost won uh, and controlled the match uh, from the outset, but Funk intentionally got himself disqualified 55 minutes in, and because the title cannot change hands in its qualification, uh, Funk retained the belt. Now, in 77, this was his era when he uh, became big in the Calgary promotion. He moved to Calgary to compete for Stu Hart. Now, uh, he teamed board Hart's son, Keith, to win the Stampede Wrestling International Tag Team title uh, in the early 77 by defeating, defeating the Cuban Assassins. 
Now, although he later dropped the belt to the Royal Kangaroos, Burke was able to regain the title in September 77 while teaming with his brother Romeo, who was uh, then competing as Bobby Burke, of all people. And uh, on December 10th, however, he lost the belts to Michel uh, Martel and Mr. Hito. Now, in the new year, 1978, uh, he, he uh, refocused himself as a singles competitor and won the Stampede North American Heavyweight Championships on numerous occasions uh, by defeating uh, Don Gagné, which uh, is the former Frenchy Mark, for the first title and Michel Martel for the second. Uh, he won it once more by defeating Larry Lane before leaving Airy to compete briefly in New Zealand. And uh, when he was in competing in the NWA territory there, he won the New Zealand version of the NWA British Commonwealth Heavyweight Championship and uh, returned to uh, Stampede Wrestling after he won the belt. So you see, as, as we're going along, uh, Leo's, uh, uh, you know, a big uh, hit in every place he's going. Now, because Calgary Stampede Wrestling was evolving in the early 80s, uh, when he returned to Calgary in 1980, he teamed with Keith Hart once again to win the promotion's International Tag Team Championship. And uh, this is where the big feud against Bret Hart started. And uh, Burke uh, and Hart were really going at it at the time. And when Burke defeated uh, Mr. Sikagawa to win the North American Heavyweight Championship, he eventually lost it to Bret Hart later that year, which, t to my memory, was Bret's first big run as a professional champion. Now, he regained it uh, in a rematch uh, uh, soon after, but uh, dropped it to Hart once again. Now, uh, after that successful run in Stampede, he came back to the Atlantic Coast to uh, compete briefly for Atlantic Grand Prix Wrestling and won the promotion's North American uh, tag team title with Hubert Gallant. Now, he eventually lost to the belts to uh, Cuban Assassin and Bobby Bass that summer, but Burke was able to regain the championship by teaming with his, uh, eventually became his best ally in that era in big man Stephen Pettipoff. Now, because AGPW only promoted shows in the summer, Burke decided to return to Calgary during AGPW's offseason, where while there he teamed with his brother Bobby Burke, of course, to regain the international championships in December 1980. Now, two months later, he had another reign as North American champion after defeating Dr. De Death David Schultz, uh, who later regained the title of rematch. Now, another reign as NWA Central States Heavyweight Championship following November, and uh, in 81, in which Cormier returned to his Tommy Martin ring name. Now, in 82, he decided to return to Stampede yet again and entered one won a tournament for the vacant North American Championship, defeating Duke Myers in the final on March 21st, 1982, to win the title. He dropped it to Brett uh, three months later, and uh, from there he followed this with a brief return in August uh, 82 to Atlantic Grand Prix when he defeated uh, the heel Ricky Valentine to win the United States Heavyweight Championship for the Federation. Now, uh, on November 1982, he teamed with longtime rival Bret Hart to win the Stampede Wrestling International Tag Team Championship. And after losing the title the following month, uh, the feud started up again, which they never stopped fighting in one way or another, kayfabe speaking. And Burke defeated Hart for the North American Championship on January 1483. Uh, and in a series of matches, some good, some were bad for Leo, uh, Hart eventually regained the championship that May. Uh, around that time, I think Burke uh, decided to uh, spend most of his time competing in Central and Eastern Canada. He uh, wrestled for Maple Leaf in uh, Toronto, where he feuded with uh, Johnny Weaver. And in the summer of 83, he uh, held both the Atlantic uh, Grand Prix United States Championship and the International Heavyweight Championship. And he was credited with additional reign as U.S. champion because he regained the title in a rematch. Uh, after it was vacated to a controversial match against the spoiler and uh, uh, later on. Uh, in February 86, uh, Burke again returned to Stampede. He, he loved competing in Calgary. One final Taylor title reign as the international tag team champions, champions with Ron Ritchie. Now, uh, as, it, as it stands right now, he finally decided to make Atlantic Grand Prix is pretty well permanent home and came back to the Fed and where he continued to win championships around the time when he had a um, uh, AWE, uh, AWE world title uh, match against uh, Ricky Champion Ricky Martel, which was, uh, you know, uh, there was it was a schmoz at the end. There was no title change hands. He held the International Heavyweight Championship there three more times from 86 to 89. 
and held the North American Tag Team Championship three times uh, as well during that period. Uh, he won the tag team titles with, by re reuniting with his former partners, Hubert Gallant and Stephen Padapaw. And his third reign came with the Cuban assassin, the dire enemy of the entire Cormier wrestling family. But at the time, the Cuban had, uh, I guess, changed his ways, and Leo uh, uh, kind of unofficially let him, let him come in in the Cormier family fold. But by the late 80s, uh, Burke also decided to uh, go more international. He decided, decided to compete in Puerto Rico's World Wrestling Council. He won the promotion's top title, the Universal Heavyweight Championship, by defeating uh, the, uh, the Fed's uh, owner and the developer, Carlos Colon, on December 17, 1989. Now, Burke held the WWC title until February 1990, when he dropped it to TNT, and uh, this was followed by another return to Atlantic Grand Prix, where he held the Tag Team Championships with his brother, Bobby Kay. Now, um, back in Puerto Rico, Burke defeated Colon again on March 24th, this time to win the WWC Television Championship, and four days later also won the WWC uh, Caribbean Tank Team Championship while teaming with the infamous Chicky Star. Now, he won the title for Invader No. 1 and Invader No. 4, but dropped it back to them in May, and shortly after dropping the Tag Team title again, Burke defeated Invader 4 in a single match to win the WWC Caribbean Heavyweight Championship. Now, um, Burke's uh, long lineage of titles finally came to an end in the summer of 1990 when he defeated Ron Starr to win the Atlantic Grand Prix International Heavyweight Championship for a fifth time. So you see, uh, he was dominating everything he was uh, involved with in Calgary and Puerto Rico, New Zealand, and the Atlantic provinces. Now, uh, on his retirement in uh, 1992, he went to Calgary uh, to set up a personal shop. Now, his old rival and real-life friend, Bret Hart, arranged uh, for Cormier to become a trainer for WWF, and uh, Cormier was really, really touching success out there because he helped train champions like Ken Shamrock, uh, Mark Henry, uh, Edge, uh, Christian, and uh, Tess. And he also trained two Canadian uh, football league players for careers in professional wrestling, uh, Jeff Thomas, and uh, the large and uh, dangerous Glenn Kalko, who I saw in competition during a Atlantic Grand Prix tour in the mid-90s in Baldoon. Now, uh, when uh, Cormier's contract expired, uh, he became he began uh, training wrestlers for WCW, but unfortunately, due to health concerns and different surgeries through the years, he, he got away from training, and um, uh, he has been invited by the WWE over the years to help return to retrain wrestlers, but uh, because of operations on his knee and different health concerns, he's been pretty well taking it easy over the last number of years, and... Uh, it uh, you know it was a it was kind of a, a way to think of this if Ric Flair is the Ric Flair of the United States Leo Burke is the Ric Flair of the Mayor Times and across Canada uh, and uh, the recognition of his talents he's excellent has been done many times through the years he was inducted in the Calgary Stampede Wrestling uh, Hall of Fame uh, and after that in 2009 he, uh, the Cormier Wrestling family is honored by the infamous Cauliflower Alley Club and uh, recognition of their contributions to the sport. And um, I think Bret Hart would say it best. He said, you know, uh, he's one of the greatest Canadian wrestlers ever. And uh, I tend to agree. Now, Les Thatcher, who uh, competed against Leo many times through the years, said uh, technically he's one of the greatest wrestlers and the most sound, most sound performers that ever stepped foot in the ring. Um, and uh, Michel Martel, uh, who wrestled against Cormier for several titles, also called him a great worker and a professional in and out uh, of the ring. Now, if anybody has followed Leo Burke's career or known his per him personally or the people in his family, professional is the word that comes in. He was always good with the fans. He was always good with the, uh, the bookers. He was also always good trying to promote the best. And like I said, he was a, a workman-like wrestler. You don't say, well, that's a Leo Burke move or whatever. He was your typical, uh, you know, strong and, and, and personable maritime wrestler. He wasn't a high flyer. He wasn't a dirty fighter. When you say Leo Burke, you think, hey, this guy was dedicated to his craft. He was almost like an artist in the ring, the way he would present, uh, get his opponent over, get himself over, get the feud over, the book, whatever. But his matches against the Cuban, the matches against people like Killer Carl Krupp or Bob Brown, or uh, you know Bobby Bass, 
you have to have uh, somebody like Leo Burke to keep a regional federation strong because you have to make that person a hero, but also make make it a way that you know if he is a double cross or loses a match, you know he's going to come back. And if anything, uh, half of WWE wrestlers and WCW through the years, the kind of uh, not say ripped off the Leo Burke persona, but the the bored very heavily from it. So again, in the history of Canadian wrestling, he's top forty, even though a lot of people may not know. Leo Burke or can we even visualize what it was like but I see all these uh, great Canadian wrestlers and the all uh, the legacy that Leo Burke had he passed it on to those great Canadian wrestlers I just mentioned and uh, you know uh, to know I all honestly think Atlantic Grand Prix wrestling is the first cousin to stampede wrestling out of Calgary because we were so connected and that's why the Maritimers are so dedicated to the Hart family to the Stu Hart legacy to Owen to Brett to Natalia, to all these people who wrestled there, even Brian Pillman. Brian was part of us. The LeDukes in Quebec, uh, you know, uh, uh, Carl LeDuc, uh, people like that. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I think the, there should be a, a wrestling museum in the Maritimes, and it should be called the Leo Burke Wrestling Museum uh, because his legacy will always live on. And I always wonder if he would have had a, uh, could have had a run in the, NWA as either, uh, you know, North American champion or whatever. Wrestling would be a lot different. He was this close to superstardom, ladies and gentlemen. But, I mean, to be a, a champion in all these federations and, you know, we grew up uh, feuding with, you know, Dusty Rhodes and the Funks and all that. My God, you can't take that away. I mean, he's uh, just tremendous. And this is dedicated to all the Atlantic Grand Prix wrestling fans, the Killer Car Crew group fans on Facebook. And uh, on this uh, Tuesday when... Uh, Canada is still devastated by the uh, loss by the Raptors last, last, last night. Pretty well at their own hands. Uh, we can also say, uh, you know, Leo Burke is always a winner. If the Raptors were more like Leo Burke last night and knew how to really take out their opponents like Leo would do, he would never give up. Maybe he would have won. So, ladies and gentlemen, you know, don't forget, cheer for the people in the ring, but if you have to boo, boo as well because a cheer is like a boo and a boo is like a cheer. Have a good one.